Hello, this is Keith Larson, publisher of Control Magazine and ControlGlobal.com. Welcome to this Solution Spotlight edition of our Control Amplified podcast. Today we're talking about the role of instrumentation and safety system integrity. And I'm joined by Howard Sio, Chemical Industry Manager for Anderson Hauser here in the U.S. Welcome, Howard. Real pleasure to have you join us. Hey, good morning, Keith. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I'm glad to uh, have a discussion with you on this functional safety topic. Well, welcome. And also joining us from Germany, we have Thomas Fritz, Global Safety Consultant, also with ENH. So welcome, Thomas. Real pleasure to have you. Good morning, Keith. Uh, thank you very much that I have the chance to speak here. Well, I think we can just kind of dive right in for those of our listeners who may be unfamiliar with the design and function of a safety instrument and system. Let's just briefly review the essential concepts. I know it's very easy to uh, spend all day talking about these things, but maybe to talk at a high level about the concept of SIS and, and their importance. All right, so I'm going to uh, start on this one. So before we dive into the SIS, the safety instrumentation system, we have to, uh, we, I want to give a definition of the process safety layer uh, right from the beginning because by, ha- by understanding the, the different layer can help us to know what is the purpose of the safety instrumentation system. So what we normally done is we de- design the, the plan based on the inherent safe plan design. And then with that, you have a process control layer such as a DCS, the distribution system, to control the process variable within the, the normal conditions. And then with that, if necessary, that the control layer uh, is going to shut out the process when the process variable is outside the normal condition. So when the process control layer is not able to shut out the process, this is where what we call the safety layer coming in, such as the SIS system, the safety instrumentation system, to automatically taking the process back to the safe state when the specific condition is violated. So this is the last layer of protection before the hazards occur. This is why we spend so much resources to make sure that the system is being designed and maintained properly. So an SIS is made out of one or more safety instrumentation function, C, and each C consists of a process sensor, a logic solver, and the final element. And so with that, you can say, well, if, if, so that actually the most critical part is uh, having the safety life cycle when you design the SIS system. From the hardware analysis at, at the beginning, to design, to implementation, and then to verification. So this is a critical loop to make sure that the SIS is designed properly and all the way to operation. Very standard across the globe. So in the U.S., it's quite commonly used, uh, which is the IEC 61511 or the ISA 84 uh, standard that the user are using to develop their SIS system. Additional to that, the safety instrument system has always something to do about risk reduction. At the end, we said a safety instrument system, SIS, has worked 100% function safe if all random systematic failures and common cause failures do not lead to malfunction of the safety system and have no influence for humans' environmental and production side. Well, sensors and valves, obviously, those are the things that actually are in touch with the process, and really you count on them to see an uh, instrument to see when things are going bad and a, and a valve perhaps to, to take action before something hazardous happens. With standard analog instruments, what are some of the things that can go wrong leading to either spurious trips that really affect your uptime or a failure to trip, even worse, uh, when needed? What are, what are some things that can go wrong with, with standard instruments? For me, a main problem is that you have a problem uh, with a device. It, it depends on the sensor or the actuator side, and you didn't get an information from the system that something goes the wrong way. I'll give you an example. If you have a freeze 4 to 20 milliamp output, the sensor, as an example, can't get this information, oh, something is going wrong with me. So we have to find a procedure at the end of the day that we can detect such kind of failures. So that could be 
uh, are logical. If we change uh, the filling in the process, we have to have change on the 4 to 20 milliamp output. So maybe I can uh, piggyback to what Thomas just mentioned about the example of the freeze 4 to 20 milli uh, freeze analog output. So for from the uh, industry today, there are some of the solutions out there to uh, to avoid this freeze analog output signal. It's like one of the solution is what we call the live signal from the instrument that can be monitored by either the PLC with programming or with a dedicated device to make sure that the, the device is still continue to provide the dynamic signal to the to your logic solver. Are the, the, the self-diagnostic capabilities of, of these smart instruments help to alleviate these issues? How does that work? For example, for a free space radar, we have more than 80 diagnostic methods in the background. So we are checking internally our device if it goes the right way. And if something happens, the internal diagnostic gets an alarm outside to say, OK, here is going, for example, the temperature too high. We have a problem with the device. And then the customer can use this information and do something specific with that. So I can maybe add one more thing here, right here. So uh, a lot of modern smart instrumentation, they are utilized to do more any 107 recommendation that they are able to provide like a basic status of the indication to identify if the device is still functioning or a different type of error. And then such as it can provide you a error of maintenance require, functional check, our specification or instrumentation failure. So those is what when, when the manufacturer, when they design the instrumentation, they have to follow the recommendation so that as a user, they don't always get a different type of error from different manufacturer with different standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, that this is quite commonly that is being utilized by the manufacturer when they design the instrument. Yeah, that makes sense. So these these diagnostics can help identify failures, and they they can really complement things like voting schemes, where you have multiple instruments, uh, where you're comparing multiple instruments. These diagnostics makes that even more robust, so that you've got even more predictability and, and detectability of those kind of um, issues. Is that fair to say? Yes, the wish list I often heard worldwide. Give me a robust system in my for my application, and I will be sure that the device is working. And if something happens, I get at every point, 24/7, an alarm is just going the wrong way. But a 100% diagnostic coverage that we can detect all failures is technical, not possible. So we said an ENH. We have it depending on different physical principle, diagnostic coverage up to 98%. That means we detect a lot of failures that can happen on a sensor side. And you mentioned before that sensors and actuator are the only two things that have direct, direct contact with the process. And at my point of view, it's very important to have a high diagnostic as much as we can deliver. There's also the need to test instruments and test valves. You have to make sure the valves are moving properly, but sometimes you have to shut down the process if you're going to do a full full stroke of a valve to make sure it's working. Or another practice is to pull the instrument out of the process, take it to a lab, test it, and put it back in place. But those that also can affect your uptime and can introduce flaws, actually. By the time you pull something out and put it back in, you may have inadvertently screwed something up. For valves, let's talk about that. Partial stroke testing is one methodology I'm aware of that ensures that the valves function properly and aren't stuck in place. How does that kind of a process implemented typically in, in a process plan? How do you determine how often to do that? And, and just tell us a little bit about what's involved in that. It depends on the user experience at the end of the day, because uh, with a partial stroke test, you close a little bit the valve, and you hope that when you meet the demand, that it closes tight at the end of the day. So you only look, okay, if it's moving, yes or no, and then we say with a high probability, it closes when we need to close it. And that's a little bit the point on the actuator side at the end of the day. But the same is valid for 
the sensor side because nobody wants to remove a device from a vessel as an example and test it externally. And that's the point that we said, okay, we have to be sure that we can offer a kind of test procedure that the customer has a good feeling at the end of the day that this kind of test procedure work very well and detect a lot of failures. Can you explain a little bit more how in situ proof testing works uh, specifically around uh, the instrumentation side versus the valves? How does that work? For the instrumentation, to perform the in situ proof testing, there are a different methods that you can you can use, such as you can do like a simple push button on the electronic. Uh, or you are able to uh, activate or trigger the proof testing from either use a handheld device or the hard command from the logic solver or from your AMS. So those are the first step you can do that. And then of course within the functional safety manual from the manufacturer, they are able to provide you all the procedures that you can follow through to perform the in situ proof testing. So the whole purpose of the in situ proof testing is like what you mentioned early that by removing the device, you may introduce what we call the systematic failure into the system. So a lot of our customer or user, they are moving to more in situ proof testing. Not only they're able to make sure that the device is still function properly to meet the safety function, but also to avoid the potential systematic failure introduction to the system. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you have anything to add to that, uh, Thomas, uh, from your perspective? May I want to go uh, with one example a little bit more, a little bit more in detail. When you look at the level switch, for example, and uh, Howard mentioned that, that we have the chance with a push button to check the functionality of the forks. I speak on the level switch uh, fork. And then we simulate internally the different kind of frequencies. And then we know exactly if the fork is covered, if we have uh, uncovered or if we have a failure via simulation, and we also can detect build-up or corrosion with the fork. And then you have a much more better feeling when you do a, a kind of proof testing with a push-button test procedure, and you don't have to do the visual inspection so often. And I don't want to say you have never do the visual inspection. By the end of the day, you want to be sure that everything is working very well, but you can extend the procedure for a visual on a long time. It's all about reducing reducing risk, and if you can do things non intrusively more often, you're going to end up with a, a lower risk in the end. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. right. And, and and the next thing is for proof testing, we are working on procedure that we are able to get more information from the sensor side outside. Because I want to say it easy, we know the health status of our devices, and we give this information. It depends on the physical principle, yes, of course, outside to the DCS system, for example. Then you can use this information, then you can say, without opening or dismounting the device, how the health status is. And that's some kind of what we are working on. So maybe I can add another example right here, uh, like a flow meter. So this is another a challenge that the user has to, to the proof testing in the past that they have to uh, remove the device annually or within a certain period of time based on the calculation to perform the full-proof testing, which is dismounting the flow meter, bring it to the calibration shop, calibrate, bring it back, reinstall. So a lot of the time, either damage the flow meter or could be a, a wrong setting is being reconfigured on the safety device that may no longer meet the safety function. So with that, having the in-situ proof testing, we can check the sensor all the way to the output. So it's a health check of the device to make sure that we are able to uncover a certain percentage of the uh, dangerous undetected failure. And then on top of that, we are also able to look into the potential systematic failures such as corrosion or buildup uh, within the flow meter, because this is something that typically you are not able to find out by just looking into the flow measurement. What about automated proof testing where you maybe have some logic within the, the SIS that automates these procedures to do this on a prescribed basis. Is that something you're working on, or is that wide, widely used already or, or been tested? Yeah, we uh, use it especially with chemical companies in, in Europe that we are working on a system that we can do an automatic proof test depending on the actual 
uh, level, for example, in a vessel that we say we tested it automatically in a way that nothing happened in the process right now and we can stop for a short period. We started an, an externally proof test and we do it as often as we like to do and nobody take care about that because the information of the proof test can be stored outside and you can have really a look. And a big advantage of an automatic proof test is you reduce the manpower to a minimum and you do it every time the same way. And therefore we use, for example, in this case, Howard said it before, the heartbeat information of a flow meter. That means the DCS system get the request to our sensors, unlock the device automatically, get all the information out, lock the device again, and then we have all the information that the sensor sees in the process. And that can be do as much as you like to do. Okay. Yeah, so just, just to piggyback uh, what Thomas is talking about here. So quite often time when we proof testing the device, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's about the systematic failure introduction. So by having the automated proof testing, so all the procedure is being uh, stored within the logic solver that is going to run through all the function block to execute those commands. So that is going to eliminate the potential, uh, like what we call the human error that uh, is being introduced during the proof testing. So that we can eliminate it, uh, those part of the potential failure. Well, that, that in the end, that's that's what it's all about, the eliminating those potential failures. Right? Well, I think we're wrap, yeah. kind of wrapping up to the to end of our time. Any other last comments, Thomas, from, from your perspective? We heard a lot of time. It's important to do the right calculation. And Howard mentioned many times. I heard from a lot of customers around the globe, yes, calculation is really important that we know when we have to prove a device. But at the end of the day, customers have to keep in mind that systematical are really the main problem driver for the application because they are happen over a period and you didn't know if a device is working tomorrow, for example, build up or corrosion. And we want to be sure, or the customer have to be sure that he know exactly the status of devices that he is using in assist at the end of the day. And that's the point. The feedback worldwide is, yeah, we did a lot of calculation and nobody keep in mind that systematical are really the real problem. So for me, it's pretty much similar to what Thomas is talking about. But what, what I want to emphasize right here is really the safety life cycle that makes sure that you are able to follow through the whole process because it's critical to have that, that the culture built in within your organization to, to have the safety culture to follow through all the steps because without the, the proper procedure or proper design, even you can get a good device from the market, you may not able to fulfill the safety function that you want to achieve to reduce the risk. So that's why I, I would like to emphasize right here. Great. Well, really, thank you very much, Howard. Thank you, Thomas, for, for joining us and really appreciate you sharing your insights uh, in this in this brief podcast today. For those of you listening, thanks also uh, for joining us today. I'm Keith Larson, and you've been listening to a Control Amplified podcast. Thanks for joining us, and if you've enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe to future episodes at the iTunes Store and at Google Podcasts. Plus, you can find the full archive of past episodes at controlglobal.com. So once again, Thomas, thank you. Howard, thank you. And uh, this is Keith Larson signing off until next time. Appreciate you guys joining us.